Hey everybody, this is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. I got a special, special guest, you know, none other than my friend, your friend, Yvette Carnell from Breaking Brown. Um, we both, you know, are here to have a discussion and just uh, do a bit of explaining. But before we start, let me do a bit of housekeeping. Please go to ToneTalks.org, go to Breaking Brown on YouTube. Both of these channels are great and, and subscribe. Go to uh, BreakingBrown.com. To donate, go to ToneTalks.org to donate. That's how we do this. We want to have a good discussion, a healthy discussion. And we just want to kind of flesh this thing out because in so many ways, you know, what we're about to talk about gets addressed in all the wrong ways. Did you want to say something to the audience? No, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for inviting me to have this conversation. And yeah, subscribe to Tone Talks, subscribe to Breaking Brown. More than ever right now, we need your support. We need individual support. You know, we're, 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 we're funded by you. We're funded by the people who, who like what we do. So much, you know, me and Abed have had this discussion in, in parts, in both separate and apart, funny enough, about what it is to be African-American and, and the consequence of this new immigration model of allowing so many Africans from different countries to come in and then actually move past Ally and actually commandeer the status of being African American. And what the reasoning behind that is, both by the government and private sector, in our minds and both based on um, on experts that have spoken to, to both of us, and really kind of flesh out what we as African Americans should be doing and how we should be approaching this. So, you know, starting this off, when I look back at African American, I think so many people don't understand that wasn't a term that we used like for a long period of time. We just recently came upon that in the mid to late 80s. Um, it, it was coined by Jesse Jackson um, as a term, and uh, particularly for progeny of American slaves that don't know what part of Africa they come from. Ironically, it has become a term that many people have stepped into and stepped out of from African countries as a way to access, you know, Americanization. And I think in many ways that, that has diminished the, the way that black people access, meaning black descendants of slaves, access America. So, you know, the progeny of slavery don't know what specific country they come from. So then we use the whole continent. For these people, they're actually from specific countries. Senegal, Nigeria, Kenya. And they actually do consider themselves country, country. Kenyan American, Nigerian American. And they use this terminology basically to normalize themselves and normalize their stories so that they can become part attachment to america that goes back 400 years you have any opinion on that no I, I think that's true i think every you know the funniest thing is that everybody says yvette i'm a pan-africanist and i believe that like we should talk about the motherland and we should talk about going home well you don't even know where going home is like you don't even know where you're from but the point of the matter is part of the problem that i have with like pan-africanism is that like it it diminishes or i would say it actually just takes away any distinction Right. So everybody says, I'm brown, I'm black, I'm just like you were all African. And I don't you know, that reduces and diminishes my claim, the claim that I have here as the citizen of a slave in the richest country in the world. So that's a problem for me in terms of in terms of how we have this conversation. Yeah. And I, I have to totally agree. And, and just to give this this a framing so you understand what you're going to be listening to. We're going to go through several areas here. We're going to go through a, a, a blogger named Lovey, who event also covered on her show yesterday who made certain comments about being about what African Americans should do as they approach American like you know oppression and it was just out of pocket. We're going to talk about Issa Rae and her show. We're going to talk about President Obama yet again for a short time in this conversation. And we're also going to talk about this uh Uber, black Uber that's run by really a Tanzanian uh man, not an uh, not an African American but presented by Ebony and Essence as though it's this overcoming story and it's run by a black man. And, uh, you know, we're kind of going to use that to kind of illuminate some of the major issues that African-Americans are having with seeing themselves because of the presence of these people. But before I do that, I think it's important for people out there to understand. And I'm pulling up an article right now titled African Immigration to U.S. Keeps Rising. This isn't like this hasn't always been the case. You know, this is just during your lifetime that Africans have been here. I think in many ways we create a narrative as though. This has always been the story because that's what we remember. But if in this article, what they show is the organization, and I'm going I'm to read a section from the article, and you can read along if I have that section up. The organization said that as of 2015, 2.1 million African-born people 
were living in the United States. That number is up from 880,000 in 2000. And back in 1970, there were just 80,000 Africans. Anything you want to say on that before I continue? Well, I mean, pe people keep thinking like this is it's always been this way. We've always had our African brothers and sisters here. No, like from African to Latino, to all of that, this is part and parcel of the Immigration Act of 1965. This is not the way, like, we've always been this diverse or whatever. No, you just you just don't know the history. That's just the point of it. Yeah, and, and this article actually talks about that. He said he added that the path for legal African immigration to the U.S. was not fully opened until the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. The top states where African immigrants live are Texas, New York, California, and Maryland, and they also noted that in 1980, only 1% of refugees admitted to the United States were African. Today, that share is about 37%. So, you know, we as African Americans, descendants of slaves, need to understand that we have a claim here. And that, that's, my, that's my first part before I get into individuals like Lovey. And the dilution of that claim it has always been one of the, the, the main things that America has tried to do, where they're saying... You guys don't deserve anything because you're three-fifths of a human. Whether it's saying you guys don't deserve anything because you can't do contracts. But now it's moved to you guys don't deserve anything because you don't need anything. And many of the reasons that, that they're using to say we don't need anything is a person like President Obama who comes from East Africa and, and represents some kind of progress that they never actually enacted. This, there isn't this blossoming community of, of successful black people that was created because of, of rectifying what you guys messed up with slavery and Jim Crow. No, you go out and you get outsourced. You outsource, basically, Af African American struggle, and you come back with these Frankenstein-type characters mm -hmm. this, that are, are basic a mimic. Of, of, of African Americans, but allow African Americans and white Americans to feel like we're past the past, you know? Yeah, they they're they're basically an illusion. Like that's what Obama is. That's what Lovey is because they know they can't. They know they can't in terms of just optics. They can't have a world without 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 dark skinned people. They have to look like we're being diverse and we're being inclusive. Well, how do we do that? without people laying a claim? How do we do that without people saying, you owe me something? Well, what we do, we just go get people who we don't owe. We just go get people who we don't owe because America didn't colonize Nigeria, right? You know, so we go get people who we don't owe something. And 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 for you not, for you not making a demand of us, we're going to use you to mask what we didn't do for African Americans. So it's like you said, we never created, America never created the circumstance for a black man or a black woman to rise to the presidency of the United States. So instead of that, we just go and get a Kenyan and a white person to come here and put him here so we can make it look like we did do it. You didn't do that for us. And so as long as we got these people here taking these spaces, making it look like they did do stuff, we don't get anything. You just replace us and make white people feel like, oh, everything's good, everything's fine. Look at the black people moving up. No, we're not African-Americans sending the slaves are moving up. You're just bringing in Africans to make it look like we're moving up. And, and they don't care either. And I, I think that there, there's actually two parts that I want to go into. And I think I'll go into the replacement part of this first. Um, the Griot did an article, you know, and I, I always talk data so you guys can get a, a fuller understanding. That article has been pulled up now, and you can go research it yourself because I'm only going to share sections. It's called, Harvard has more black students than ever, but are they African American? It was written in 2011. The Harvard Gazette reported that 11.8% of its incoming class of 2015 will be blacks. Columbia University has doubled its percentage of black students from 6% to 12% in only one year. 10% of, Stan of Stanford students are black. But the question that remains is are the African Americans, are these people descended from slavery? And, and they're not. What you actually find is back in 07, African students constituted nearly 40% of the black students admitted to Ivy Leagues. And it probably rose in the, by, by the time we got to 2011, 2012, what you see is that they're masking the fact that we have been underserved, under underprivileged, and we are underclass in this country, meaning African Americans, descendants of slaves, with people who, in their own country, are quite wealthy. Because, you know, in this article, the original one that I pull up again, African immigration to U.S. keeps rising, what he also noted was that the people that come over here are, are wealthy. Okay, this is the exact quote from the article, African Immigration to U.S. Keeps Rising. It's a long distance from Africa. 
And the number of people in Africa with sufficient incomes to migrate that far has been relatively small. When I was in South Africa, that's the exact sentiment that I got talking to South Africans. They're, that, you know, the people that are actually in the U.S. are not representative of, of Africa. They're not representative of, of, of the overall, like, population mindset or, or wealth level at all. And so, like, you know, you said something just yesterday that I wanted to flesh out. And I think this is the perfect moment to do that. And you alluded to Africans should not be competing against African Americans. And most people could take that wrong and think that you're saying that African Americans are not good enough to keep compete with Africans. No, 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 no. What you're actually saying is that they have two parents. What you're actually saying is they don't descend from slavery. What you're actually saying is that they have wealth. What you're actually saying is they are immigrants and should compete against other immigrants. Instead of coming to a, a, a set of resources, a, a set of set-asides. That's what affirmative action was. If you watch the Lyndon Johnson speech at Howard, this was a set aside to deal with and rectify the damages caused both by slavery and Jim Crow in some way. But somehow that set aside has been relegated to color over history. And in doing that, a whole generation of black people, of black descendants of slaves have been cut out and replaced with people like Lovey. I mean, I, I think that's important and I want to drill down on that point. What you said is that, you know, this speech, and if anybody doesn't know it, just Google LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson at Howard University. And what he said is, look, you you people, he's talking about African Americans. He said, I have to create a program for you all to make it because you've been enslaved and you can't make it on your own. So you can't, you're in a race where you can't make it. That's what he said. He was talking specifically, though. He gave that speech at my alma mater, Howard University, because he was speaking specifically to African Americans. You all are allowing and we're allowing you know, Africans, Nigerians, Ghanaians who come from the top 1% and the top 10% of their communities to come here and eat that. But what you're basically doing is eating our food. You're eating our opportunity. OK, and you're masking because you don't have a claim here in America and they know you don't have a claim here. And so white capital doesn't have a problem putting you in the forefront because you're not going to make a make a stink because you don't have a claim here and you know it. They know you don't know it. So basically, there is this deal going on between white capital and Africans. And that's what's happening. And we're being locked out of opportunity. And we won't talk about being locked out of opportunity because it's Africans. But it was specifically designed for us. That was redressed for the descendants of slaves. It was not redressed for all immigrants who have pigmentation and women and everybody else. It was not designed for you. And we have to start, we have to get into a space now where we start calling what's ours, ours. And we have to draw a line. No, this belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you. It was designed for you. You were not enslaved in this country. If you have a problem with your colonizers, you have to go back to where you were or go back to I don't care who it was, whether it was England, France or whatever, and make your claim. But your claim is not here. I have to totally agree. And what, what I'm actually seeing is that black Americans don't understand their wealth level and what that means in terms of their dreams and their hopes. You know, I put a post up earlier today, funny enough, and people started sharing it. They started really liking it. It's a quote I just kind of kind of made up and it's so much of black failure is compartmentalized into the future through dreams that make so little sense so what we've done is we basically say you know it's all gonna get fixed in the future and what I'm telling you and what I'm telling you by the data is it's not wealth is calcified and, and, and legacy matters more than ever and your legacy is one of slavery and I think that in so many ways what you have to understand is that what we're saying in terms of the data is that imagine if you came to America after the Cosby show. That's what we're saying about the, the reality of, of, of African immigration, is that you have wealthy Africans primarily, and they like to say that they weren't wealthy, but they were. They, they, they might have a master's degree or be a doctor, and maybe they don't have money, but they're highly educated still. And so like they, they come here after the Cosby show. That's after slavery. That's after Jim Crow. That's in an America that really wants to see black people like in their homes because of Bill Cosby and basically then make judgment. And that allows us to transition into Lovey. You know, I, I wasn't as familiar as you are with her and I'd like you to introduce her. But we had a comment made by Lovey basically minimalizing black tragedy, black struggle as if she has a right. And we kind of placed her there. 
So I'll let you speak on Lovey and then I'll join you. No, I mean, in. if you all don't know Lovey, she's she's basically a humorist. She's not a she's not a highbrow intellectual. She's not anything. She's not a you know a, a she's a person who listen. This is a person who writes about Real Housewives of Atlanta. This is a person who writes about scandal. That's how she made her claim to fame. And she's basically coming into this space of African Americans and telling us how we should feel about trauma. But the thing about it is you came here at nine years old and there was a tweet from her that I shared on my show where she basically said, I didn't know anything about African Americans when I got here. I didn't know anything about slavery. I didn't know anything about the Middle Passage. I didn't know anything about race. Well, actually, let, 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 let me let me pull it up so we can actually okay. get her get her, her words as she said it because it's worse than that to me. Yeah. She says, this is awesomely lovey. At L-U-V-V-I-E. This is her official Twitter. Um, I didn't know a thing about African Americans being slaves when I was growing up. I thought everyone had a maid and driver like I did. I mean, just think about what she's saying there in that comment. And I'm going to come with a second comment that you can actually see her say in a second. But it's, it's so much of a, a slap in the face to all the African American women that support her. That, that don't know the difference and actually see her as... A, a, a confidant as the same as them and I, I think that what it actually also shows is she's nothing like you and yep. I and I, I feel like in, in many ways she's not just your class enemy she's your enemy plainly because yep. fundamentally she's being used to mask things and, and then also acts like she understands the ghetto because a lot of her posts like I seen one yesterday already it had all this like ghetto stuff in there she's not from the ghetto stop it stop it and like you, you came here at nine. You privileged. Why do you got Nene leaks? Why do you got ghetto gifts in your stuff? That's not you. I'm tired of this. These Africans are coming over here and they black facing. She's doing that because you like it. She's doing that. She don't do that with her pops. She do that for you to get you to like press like on her stuff. She's playing you. And so I come back and I come back to it and I say this just so you can give context is. I went further and actually found an interview. I would cut it in, but I don't want to deal with copyrights and all that. So I just share it with you. This is out of her mouth. You can take it how you want to. She said, um, this is the words of Lovey. I wrote a blog post about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. And it started from somebody tweeting me and saying they heard, heard the word Dakota. Tell them what it means and do I use it? The, and this is her, her direct language. The word Dakota is a word a lot, a lot of West Africans, Nigerians and Ghanaians use to describe African Americans. At its base, it means wild animal. Mm. I mean, and then she tried to clean it up with some, you know, a lot of people don't know what it means. I don't hear none of that. Think about what you what you supporting. And well and she said in a tweet, somebody asked her if that's what she was, and she was like, Me, no, I'm not. I'm I'm a hundred percent Yoruba. I'm this, I'm that. Like you were, and then you were like, "But I don't use the word." Yes, you do. Yes, you were. You were just, you just got caught. The problem is, you just got caught. And the problem is too, when you, when somebody tells me, right, like I didn't know about the Middle Passage, I didn't know about slavery, I didn't know y'all had a car and a driver. Please tell me what separates you from a white person. You sound like every white person I've ever known who said, I never know about this. Teach me about this. Teach me about this. I didn't understand this. Teach me. You are just like a what separates you from being a white person. You are my enemy just like white people are. And now you're in a space where you speak for me. Like I went through her bio. She's getting invited to all these places to talk about black people and black issues. You're not us, though. How are you going to talk about that stuff when you are not us, when you just learned about it from us and now you're going to be the spokesperson? Now you get invited to do TEDx and all of that for what? For doing and, Real Housewives and stuff? I, no, and because I, you're not a threat. And I would go, you know, and it's funny, I interviewed uh, Sandy Darity, and you can check that interview out on my channel. At one point, this is Duke professor, used to be the head of the WDB Du Bois Cook Center at Duke. And he, he actually just brought this up on his own that at the admissions office, you know, in a conversation on the side, they basically alluded to the fact that they choose Africans because they're docile. So they're, yep. so so think about the dynamic of what we're saying, meaning they won't protest. So they're taking up spots that came from protests. And then they're saying, I won't protest because I'm good. Come on, man. And I, I think in so many ways, what we what we see is that African-Americans can't digest things beyond color. And we have to now. We have to. And if we don't, we're going to we're going to die out. It's just what it is, because right now what's happening is we're eating the failure. They're eating the success. 
at at large mm-hmm. rates. At large rates. And I, I think that, you know, when you look at what you just said, she also was heavily, meaning lovey, in support of who? Hillary Clinton. No black yep. person that has any kind of, like, knowledge of politics was in support of Hillary Clinton that way. That that was just crazy what she was saying. Like, she didn't understand anything about politics. And, and she's trying to get black women to follow her like the Pied Piper to vote for Hillary Clinton. When you and look she- at... When you look at Michelle Alexander's piece, which I'll pull up right now, and I've talked to Michelle, and I did a piece right after Michelle, the Clintons were horrible for black people, but they weren't horrible for her and her family. They, she wasn't here for mass incarceration. She wasn't here for welfare reform. She wasn't here for black America. She was here after the Cosby show when the, when the rain left away and the rainbow showed up and it looked a lot better. That's when she came. And, and let's and let's be and let's be honest. Like she don't have no daddy in jail. She don't have no mama strung out on crack because because the community because the, you know because crack was infused into black community. She don't have none of that. So she don't have none of that baggage. And let's be honest about one distinction too. She wasn't in favor of Hillary Clinton the way that African Americans were in favor of Hillary Clinton. If you talk to African Americans who voted for Hillary Clinton, they said, "Well, she was the less of two evils. We just had to. We didn't have no choice." She was like, she was on some stuff like Hillary Clinton was the best candidate we've ever seen in, in politics. She had some kind of weird tweet like that. Like she doesn't get it. Like she's not you. She's not one of us. The people, those of us, and I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, but those of us who voted for Hillary Clinton in the black community voted because. You know, well, she's the lesser of two evils. We didn't. You don't like her, but you felt. But they felt like I got to vote for her, right? Over Trump. Because she, Over yeah, Trump. I feel like she's. Oh, she's the lesser of two evils. I'm make. No, Luby was like. Lovey was like. No, she's the best. She's the best candidate we've ever had. And even after she was gone, Lovey was like, you know, why y'all keep bringing up her name? She's somewhere taking naps because of everything y'all put her through when y'all didn't choose her. No, she's a straight. She's a straight. She's a straight. I mean. This is this is awful what she is in terms of, she's awful for our politics. Awful. So I come back to it. The middle black family is worth seventeen hundred dollars. The middle black single mother is worth five dollars. Unemployment for African American males, descendants of slaves throughout much of the Rust Belt is forty five percent. One in three have been to been incarcerated. What you see is that black America is largely socially collapsed. So what America does instead of resolving this is the consequence of all the damage that you inflicted on this group is bring in some cover. And when we start to look at this thing, that's the biggest problem with this whole thing is that these people serve as cover. And they allow, if, if they were delineated as a separate group, I think it would be so much more healthy. It, but the only problem is that they yeah. wouldn't be on TV. Like it's hard to get an Asian on TV. It would be the, Obama got elected, you know, and I'm going to transition to Obama. Obama got elected because of sign still delivered. Stevie Wonder, because of Jay Z mm-hmm. pounds, because mm-hmm. of the black vote coming out at insane rates, because of the, the hip cool that we gave him, because of the way that we washed off the Hussein and replaced oh. that with with swagger. Like yeah. he, like I just think in so many ways, you know, you look at this thing, and I always come back to the numbers. Obama inherited five hundred thousand dollars from a white grandmother. If that ain't white, I don't know what white is. And I think that in so many ways we don't understand, and I'll contextualize it. There's about 40 million blacks. I think it's about 2,000 blacks that are in a will for that amount of money. That's it. That's a real, what I'm telling you is that that number that, that he inherited, and it came from a white person, it, it, it really locks him in steadfast with white life in a way that you can't even understand because you don't just inherit $500,000. That means throughout life you got gifted things that made you have the privilege of whiteness. We already know about the Punahou High School, and we already know about all the trips and the chauffeurs and living in a penthouse in Hawaii. But I think that in so many ways we recreate him like he's our uncle that we knew, and he's not. He just learned how to per- how to act like your uncle. Yeah, perform. He learned how to perform blackness, and that's what they all do. That's what Lovey did. Like that's what Issa Rae did. Like all of them learn how to perform blackness. Like I'm going to, I'm going to use blackness. She said something very important to me, Lovey. She said I, that was a tweet from her. I always said that I would be in the credits of your, of your, of your, of your favorite show. 
Like, they come here with a plan. You think they're just doing something, they're having fun on the internet, they blow up. No, their plan is to leverage african Americanness and to get you on their side. That's their plan. And to use that to put them in a space where they have access to white capital. That's not anything that happens by mistake. And we support them all the way because they're talking about stuff that we like. Scandal, housewives, all of this stuff. And you're even talking about, like, Lovey does something like, out here. You know, she talks about, out here. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. That's not even, like, something that you, I don't even think that's something that you say in front of your parents, in front of your people. You're just leveraging our cultural traditions to and get you yourself further. access to white capital. And I would go further. It's like, when I listen to you, there's certain dialect coming from the South that I just don't do. I live here in California. I was born and raised here. Yeah. She's performing Southern dialect. Yeah, that's true. You know, they love to use the word ratchet and, and, and this and that. And it's like, dude, just be African. Just be Nigerian and see if they buy that show. Just yep. do a show about being from Nigeria. What you wear, your garb, all that. I'm not, And that's cool. And see if they that's buy fine. it, though. That's fine. That See if they buy that show. But you're right. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's something you hear right in Georgia. That's something you hear in Alabama. You hear it in parts of Tennessee. You don't hear where you're from, lovey. Even when you got to America, you were like Chicago or something. You don't hear that. That's not what you hear there. You're just taking parts of what we are as black people and, and, and even in the South, and you're using it making to get quilt. access to white people. She's like, making we're a quilt. always the doormat. She's making a quilt of blackness and wrapping herself in it. That's exactly what you see. And, and it's Obama was the same way. You know, people don't understand. He didn't sound like that. And they went and they taught him the dialect of Southern preachers. And, and I think in so many ways it's important to differentiate, not just for the fact of saying we're different, but because we have claim to the wealthiest country ever. And right now we're losing ourselves. Like, when I say that the middle black families are $1,700, understand that means that your kids have little dream, little space for dreams. I, 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 whether you, you hear me now, or whether you see it when you look around in, in five years or even tomorrow. It's just the truth. You can't compete in America with the worth of $1,700. I have never made that clear, but I'm trying to tell you today. When I say the middle black families are $1,700, that means, just like the Urban League said, you're locked out. Now, somebody would say, what does it help having, like, a, talking about Africans with that, that issue? You need them to, meaning greater America, to confront that head on with no cover. You don't need people who aren't worth $1,700 coming in and basically saying, well, it's okay. That look like you. That's, yep. that, that will allow America to sidestep it. And no person has been more problematic in that way than Barack Obama. Barack Obama was half white, born white, and half East African. I told you before, we're from West Africa. He's from East Africa. Almost a world apart from even where you come from, genetically. But somehow you feel a connection because y'all look the same. That's not enough anymore, and your kids can't eat, look the same. What your kids could have ate is programs that he would have set up had he actually been from where you're from. No, I think you're right. I think, and I think you know people. People say, "Well, Yvette, you just you just xenophobic." I, you know, back in the day, I've helped Africans get citizenship because I bought into that stuff, right? And the thing about it is what you realize now when you look at the data is that if we're honest about it, we can't have our claim if you're here. And that's that's not just them, but it's them. We can't have our claim. There is no claim if you're here mimicking us, if you're here acting like you're us, if you're here pretending to be us with all the money that came from Af from where you're from. Resources. So we got a car and a driver. Yeah, you we have can't, to, can't have you here. And, and you have to, you know, we presume so many times that people have the basics down, and black people don't. You know, and I wrote one of the pivotal pieces on land. You can go Google it. Black people own like 1% of the land here. African-American descendants of slaves. You're, you're, you're competing against people that might own oil mines, orange groves, peanut farms, steel mines. You know, you're competing against them, and they're competing in a slot that was designated with your... And it's funny, because I'm going to use the word disability. And I know it has a connotation of like physical disability. But you have to understand that when this race was ran in America, wealthiest country ever, we weren't in the race. We were shoes. We were equipment. Battered and beaten and set aside. They were not. And so like what you have now is that there were set asides to deal with the reality of we use these people as equipment. And now you have a group that wasn't equipment that comes over 
and basically eats the majority of the set aside. Do you understand the consequence of what that's going to mean for black America going forward? I don't think you do. It means that we're basically out altogether. And we're not even fighting for ourselves to be in. No, we have the Congressional Black Caucus, which is fighting immigration, not only in terms of Latinos, they're saying, well, this uh, this impacts black immigrants, so we have to fight. Who? Because the immigrants are impacting us negatively. So you have our own Congressional Black Caucus saying that we're going to fight, not on behalf of native black people, descendants of slaves, we're going to fight on behalf of African immigrants who negatively impact us. These are the people who are acting for us in terms of the CBC. And you don't know, like, you don't know what they have. Like, I knew people at Howard University. Somebody said, I saw somebody say, like, um, was Luffy telling the truth? I think she was exaggerating about having a driver. No, like, they, that's what they do in Nigeria. Because like, cla- they have class, classes. They, all have it. they have classes. I'm going to pull up a chart right yep. now again to show you how flat black America is. We don't have classes. As no. much as you might think you're bougie, you're not. You're not. You, you like the. It's not just that the middle black families were seventeen hundred dollars. Almost all black families have very little wealth. They don't have the wealth to compete in this very, very rich country. But they do often. The ones that can make that trip, just like was in the article. And I think that you got to understand. Obama also had a chauffeur. Obama also had a chauffeur. This, this is. I, 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 in so many ways, what you see is that we don't know how to navigate like globally the reality of like the black experience so we create a narrative that everybody was oppressed by white people the same yeah exactly and and, and in so many ways like i also want to address something that's going to come up in the comments what about the caribbeans and like it's funny because you look back to belafonte and port and sydney portier and these are people from the bahamas and from west indies but when they came here in that time they were forced to acclimate into our, 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 our struggle in a wholly yep. different way than we demand today. You never would have heard Harry Belafonte say what Lovey just said about about tragedy and, and judging people's tragedy. I mean, Stacey Patton, the professor that you posted, she had a, a powerful statement saying, you don't have none of this in your family. Who are you to come over here and tell? I mean, imagine going to Rwanda or South Africa and then living there for less than a lifetime and then telling them you shouldn't talk about apartheid no more. You shouldn't talk about yep. like all those mass killings that happen. You should just like pick yourself up and and, and you know learn to love white people. <laughs> Imagine that, you know. Yeah, and the funniest thing is like the funniest thing I think is that we don't have a word like they have a word of kata which describes African Americans, descendants of slaves, as wild animals. We don't have a word for that. We're not those kinds of people. We don't have a word. You're a third world country. We don't have a word though to describe you badly. We've always seen you as good people. You have a word that as describes our people. You. As our people. As our people. That's how we've always we've always been good to you. But you go behind closed doors and you talk about us like that. That's who you are. And we sit around and talk about how you're an ally, how you're good people, how you're black like us. And then what she said in that thing too was like, well, you know, some of y'all talk because you know you're mixed. You don't have a lot of melanin. And that you know that kind of hit me. My mama was made in a sharecropper and all that stuff. And you're going to say, well, I don't have melanin. That's your distinction? Because you don't understand what it means to be African-American, which which is why you don't need to be here. And you still don't need to be here speaking for us because you don't get it. Like, you don't understand miscegenation. We're 13%. You're from a country where everybody's black, right? So you don't even understand what I'm talking about. You don't even understand what it means, slaves and slave owners. You don't get that at all. And so you don't even have the intellectual heft to be in this environment, to talk, to say anything. But like you just said, I would never go to Nigeria or Ghana and be like, y'all need to get over that colonization stuff. That ain't even like, what y'all talking about? That's arrogance. And that's not being deferential to the people who are there. And, and, and you got to really understand that there's a lot of black people in, 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 across this country that don't even leave their city. And, and for these people, you know, whether it be uh, Lovey, Issa Rae, Obama, well-traveled. Traveling all around the globe, and I, I and it's it's a crazy because they have no, they're so class driven, like that they don't have any kind of uh, compassion for the reality of the black experience and why that's the case. Why don't you just get a passport or some craziness that Obama, you know, would spout off to Howard students? What was it, Morehouse students about about working harder? And it's like. For, you know, you have Obama saying work harder and the world's not going to be easy. And in a time where Thomas Piketty, capital of the 21st century, on the other side is saying hard work don't isn't like the game anymore. It's all inheritance. 
No. And so, like, you know, I'm going to move on to Issa Rae. And, and, you know, I've talked about her in a whole segment. You can check that out on my channel. You know, she has a show. I watched a few episodes. And to me, it's very degrading to African-Americans, particularly African-American men. Uh, it wasn't healthy, the use of language. It was a misportrayal of black life. People will say, well, you don't have a right to police blackness. And what I would say is that at the same time, I don't have a right to make a show where I basically like make fun of black women. I'm an attorney here in Los Angeles. I've used this example. If a black woman that, that's a hairstylist that went to Compton High sends me a text message that she didn't spell a word right, it's inappropriate for me to make a show about that and laugh about it on national television. And, and, and the fact that that, that has been the, the, the catch-all for like um, African American humor about African American men, particularly and African American families, is a, is a is a shame. And so, like for me, I look at that. I look at that, and I just come to the same conclusion. She's half Senegalese, raised, you know, partly in Senegal, to my understanding, then in white America on the and, and on the East Coast. I think Connecticut. Then came here and lived in one of our wealthiest communities called Ladera Heights, Baldwin Hills, and and throughout her teens. And now is projecting rapping on. She was like rapping like the ghetto on yeah. her show. I, I would respect it more if it was just a show about somebody from Senegal that got introduced to America and don't understand where she lived. But that's not what it was. It was the acclamation of a right to judge, and you don't have that right. No, yeah, it was a right. It was a right to judge. It's just like they know, like this is like people. Like, let me just say this: African Americans are some of the most compassionate, best people. Like we're good people. We don't think about the fact that these people come into our community with a plan, right? You came into the community with a plan. I'm going to leverage your culture, the African American culture, to come up. So she's sitting there, and it's not black face because you're black. It's African American face. You African American face. Well, I'm going this and this and that and ha and. And nobody, you're not talking about, you're not trying to be a rapper. You're making fun of it. You're, you're mocking it. And you're mocking everything that we are. You're not like somebody who's sitting down and trying to be a rapper. That's not who you are. You're not Queen Latifah in the late 80s or whatever. That's not what you're doing. You're just making fun of us. And that's what people don't understand. These people are mocking us. And even the scene where there was a guy and he was kind of nerdy, he was trying to talk to us. You're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, you're just mocking. And like, how do you how do you get the right to like make fun of African American men? You're not African American. You're not. You're just an awkward like Senegalese African. That's who you are. That's Be you that though. Yourself. That's Be what that. you call yourself until you get in a room where they're looking for an African American. And that's yep. that that's the 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 catch all. What's happening is. America has slots for African Americans, particularly. And that comes as a large result of the consequence of being African American. It's redlining, slavery, Jim Crow. What's happening, though, is that white people don't know the difference when they look at us. And we never demanded that they make a delineation. So now when they're looking for an African American, the way that, that Africans move is much more like, tight-knit community so one gets in and they only share their resources with the other ones you remember the show last night where you talked about the the black the black guy the black actor called in and i did a show on uh, did a uh, a video on, on the movie get out and i talked about how that should have been an african-american actor it's an african-american story it's not an african story it's not a story about london they have had interracial dating for a hundred years just like samuel yep. l jackson said this is a story about being african-american and the struggles you go through not being brown and so, like, in so many ways, what you see is that 12 Years a Slave, Martin Luther King and Selma, uh, uh, Get Out, black male actors can't even get a role. And nobody cares. And it's real that, that, that that's actually as a result of purposeful action, you know? Yeah, and the dude from Get Out was just so ignorant. Like, the guy from Get Out, when people, when Samuel L. Jackson said what he said, Samuel L. Jackson said, listen, we need opportunities for African-American actors. This dude said, well, I'm always the blackest person in the room. Don't nobody care. That's not the point. The point is not how dark your skin is. The point is whether or not you're African-American. Being a brown person.
person does not make you African American. Being whatever you are, Ghanaian or the Nigerian, does not make you African American. This is about our legacy in this country and the claim that we have. That don't make you so. So you're talking about, well, I'm blue black or whatever. I don't. That doesn't make you African American. What are you talking about? But they get in these rooms and they say this, like, well, I'm not black enough. It's not about being black enough. It's about being African American, and it's about the claim that we have in this country. So people should have shot back at him for even saying that. It's not about how dark skinned you are. And and the funniest thing is when you talk about the guy who made the movie, like he said, yeah, yeah. I think it was Peel. He said basically, I want an African American, but this guy basically convinced me that 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 all that racism is the same. So you basically got in a room with the man who was doing this movie in terms of Skype. You skyped him, and you got it. You got in his head and convinced him that racism is the same. You're a freaking scoundrel, man. That's what you did. You cut off an Afri oh, African-American actor. That's what you did. You cut an African-American actor off at the past with that Skype conversation. Because it's not, being an African-American is not the same as being a Carib as being a Jamaican, as being a, a, a Ghanaian, as being an Eritrean, as being a Kenyan. That's what you did. So uh, really, when you think about it, a lie got you that part. A lie that you told the guy who made the movie got you that part. And it's so, it's so, it's so telling that everyone has a problem when you say that they're not African-American, but then they use this terminology of Eritrean-American, of Nigerian-American, of that delineates that they're not African-American. And they uh, they themselves will tell you they're not African-American until there's something to get from being African-American. Yep. And and that that's the, that's the problem is like, we're being cut off from delineating ourselves and creating group and group interests and having people then, you know, there was an actor that, that called into your show yesterday, and he was talking about like how you know somebody uh, said, said there, there was a manager. And, uh, you need you need a manager. You need an agent and all this stuff in Hollywood. And there was a manager that that said, "I'm gonna call this person to like talk to you." And it was an African. And then the person never called him back. And like you need that person to be another descendant of slavery. I'm not saying just because yeah. they're descendant of slavery they're gonna call back. But you need it to be uh, that much more of a likely chance because it's already a narrow, narrow like like lane. I think for so many African Americans, it comes back to my quote that I read earlier, where I basically said to you, you know, so much of black failure is compartmentalized into the future through dreams that make so little sense that you need all those things to line up for this to make sense. You to be a, the next Denzel Washington. You need to be the next Denzel Washington. You need Spike Lee to get a uh, a movie and the distribution, yep. and Spike Lee to be looking for African American actors that descend from slavery, and then for that manager that Spike Lee knows from being at Howard or Morehouse or whatever to look around and see you. You don't need any confusion because you need it all to line up, every yep. last thing, every last domino. And yeah, you need your tribe. You need your tribe. Like Spike Lee, Denzel Washington, all the actors, Samuel L. Jackson, all the actors that we know from that, they were all the same tribe. These are African Americans. That's our people. So you need that. We don't do we have Samuel L. Jackson without all of that? No. You know, you don't know. Do we have Denzel Washington no. without Spike Lee? All of that stuff has to line up, but this has to be our tribe. These other people ain't looking to get you in a movie. They don't they they they, they you're not their tribe. And, and so, so you have to under, you have to distinguish and understand who we are as African Americans and that we are a specific group and we have a right to have a collective, you know, and to lay a specific claim that does not include anybody else. Before we get to the last section, uh, for anybody that would challenge Yvette saying about the tribe and how do you know that they wouldn't consider you part of their tribe, I come back to this statement by Lovey. I wrote a blog post about relationships between Africans and African Americans. And it started from somebody tweeting me and saying they heard the word akata. Tell them what it means and do I use it? The word akata is a word a lot, a lot of West African, Nigerians, Ghanaians used to describe African Americans. And at its base, it means wild animal. Nobody's trying to be in a tribe with a wild animal. These are not your people. The fact that they came up with a word to describe you that way, like I said, we never described them that way. We've never come up with a word to describe third world Africans. Whether no matter where you're from, we've never come up with a word to describe you disparagingly. Disparagingly, we've always viewed you as family. And I'ma say it: it's time to stop viewing you as family. I viewed you as family too in my 20s and early 30s. It's time to stop doing that. You're not family, and you've shown us that. And it's time to move into that space. 
And so, like, the last little section is how black media plays a role in perpetuating this imagery by not fully telling, like, stories correctly. I'm going to pull up a story from Essence, and it basically talks about this, um, it's, it talks about this article that uh, was, was done on this black Uber. And then the art, the way they wrote the story is dribble, you know, I, and you don't write a story about a, a company without talking about the company's raise, without talking about the company's employee level, without talking about some basic stuff. And it's just all not there. It's all aspirational talk as if black people have overcome all of the, the adversity and created an Uber. But fundamentally, when you go to a, 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 a I, I hate to say it, a site that writes better pieces what you get is a fuller story. And in that fuller story, you find out that the guy is Tanzanian, that his real model isn't to compete with Uber here, it's to actually start up in third world countries. What you get is that you just get a lot more reality of, of this isn't isn't the, the we shall overcome story that Ebony and Essence are reporting. It's really a story about Africans using African American media to push uh, an aspirational like message that never happened for black people in this country. No, I think it's true, and that's what always happens, right? You remember, you remember all the stories we seen about the kids and the kids going to college, and this person, this black person, and they would say black person, black black student gets gets into all Ivy Leagues, black student gets this, and and, and inevitably, ninety percent of the time, these are Africans, but we celebrate that as a win for us. That's not a win for them. They're not even, most of the time, not even going to marry anybody African-American. They're opposed to that. They'll tell you quick, I don't marry African-Americans most of the time. I don't do that. I marry other people. I marry people from my Yoruba tribe. I, mar I don't marry you. I don't deal with you. But we celebrate that as a win for us. A win for them is not a win for us. And I'm just telling people, like, don't be upset, like, if you just, if you just got here. Like, I used to think that, too. I used to think a win for them is a win for us because we all brown. No, that's how they leverage and get in because they know we know that and they know we feel that way. And they use that compassion and that kinship that we have to leverage and take what really belongs to us. So, you know, this discussion, we kind of went through Lovey, Obama, Issa Rae, get out the movie. And we really came out, came out with, with the message. And I guess what I'm going to leave off with is just to say my biggest issue is that we just can't afford to have a cover over the poverty and struggle that black America's experiencing. When I say a cover, I mean, these people, if they are here, which they are, they should have to delineate themselves separately from African Americans that descend from slavery. And we should really get the data on how descendants of slaves are doing. I mean, it's funny because one of the first reports ever that showed Africans broke apart from African Americans in terms of wealth happened here, and it's with Sandy Darity and, and the Federal Reserve. It was called The Color of Wealth. I wrote on it on inequality.org. And what it showed is while the middle black family that descends from slavery in L.A. is worth $200 liquid, $3,000 hard, the middle African family is worth $75,000, $70,000. What you get is this reality then is that, is that you know, if I have a program at UCLA or, or at USC, I just fill it up with Africans and, and don't deal with the fact that no black people are qualify, qualifying for all the standards. And I, I think that the long play of this is that we'll be totally replaced. And I don't think we really see it. And my goal with this discussion is to flesh this out and to say it's unacceptable that Lovey came at you. If she came at you, came at Stacey Patton, not on my watch. It's unacceptable that she has a show. She, you know, based on based on nothing but gimmickry. Or, or mockery of, of, of African American women to me, and so like I let you say your last piece, and then I will close it out. No, I just want to say there's a reason. Like you know, I've been doing this for years. You've been doing this for a while now, right? Like when I look at what what Lovey's been invited to do and how she's been elevated, I have to ask myself for what? Like she's basically a, she's basically just kind of talking about stuff that doesn't matter. Like you're talking about stuff that doesn't matter. Reality TV doesn't matter. Scandal doesn't matter. There's a reason why she gets elevated because she's talking about stuff that doesn't matter. People like us don't get elevated because we're talking about stuff that matters. So she gets elevated as an African, right? Who is talking about stuff that doesn't matter. She doesn't have a claim to, to she doesn't have a claim to lay in this country and she's talking about stuff that is of no consequence. You should think about why she got elevated and you should think about African Americans and African American women while you're elevating her. 
Why are you elevating her when she when she is not going to do anything that is beneficial to your life? To your material well-being and the material well-being of your children. She's elevating herself individually. You should think about that when you're thinking about who needs to rise to the top. All right, and and so much, and so thank you guys for tuning in again. I love. Thank you so much, Yvette, for coming and having this discussion. No um, Yvette Carnell, go to breakingbrown.com. Please donate, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, Breaking Brown. Please also subscribe to Tone Talks here on YouTube and go to tonetalks.org to donate. We're really trying to keep bringing this discussion. You can have the dialogue on the, on the bottom of this page. Please share this video. Let's get it around. Let's open the dialogue. And let's move this ball along because black people need to. Thank you so much.